Welcome one, welcome all. For August the 2nd, Adult Stone School lesson at Calvary Baptist Church, Jessup, Georgia. My name is Pete Boyd, associate pastor here. And we're looking at this topic today, a biblical answer to beverage alcohol. What does the Bible say? It's mainly from the book of Proverbs. There are three passages we're going to look at today. Proverbs chapter 20, chapter 23, and also chapter 31. The Bible says a lot of things about strong drink, about alcohol itself, about wine. And it's not as clear-cut as many people would like to think it is. And we, we know this topic can be somewhat controversial because people do get a little bit sensitive about alcohol. And a lot of times... People already have their mind made up before we even turn to any verse in the scripture. So people who are already dead set it against alcohol that believe in absence, you know, their minds are made up. And those people who believe that it's okay to be a social drinker, their minds are made up as well. Now, this topic is not for lost people. I'm talking to the church today. What does the Bible have to say about alcohol pertaining to the believer on Christ? So I, my prayer is that you have an open mind as we go over this lesson this week. Let's we'll start with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity to share your word. And no matter who's out there listening and watching, I just pray that they will have an open mind, open eyes and ears and heart to what your Bible says, not what Brother Pete says. Because people don't care what I, I think. They care what you think. And I just pray, Father God, you'll help me to be clear, concise, more importantly, to be accurate based on what your word says. And I pray that we will all have a spirit of humility, a spirit of meekness as we go through this lesson today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. When I think about alcohol, I think about what's been going on in the Grand Canyon. Over these last couple of years, it seems like we have a lot of people. It's, it's usually a flurry of people, male, female, older people, middle-aged people, who are falling off visiting the Grand Canyon, falling off to their deaths. And last year, it seemed like there were a rash of deaths. There were like three inside of two months or something. I mean, it was, it was like in the news a lot. And really, on average, the Grand Canyon, five people a year in America, out of the millions of people that come, five people a year fall to their death. And there's a common factor here, and it's usually this, that people who wanted to get as close to the edge as they possibly can. Why? To take a great picture, I guess. You see, there you can go online and, look and Google, you know, dangerous pictures at at the Grand Canyon, and you'll find a lot of people who try to push the envelope. They know that they can fall to their death, but they're so enticed by getting a great view, a great picture, or to be funny. <laughs> and some people have fallen to their deaths. And it doesn't matter how many signs you put up and rails you put up. One guy that runs the park says it doesn't, people are walking on top of the rails and around, and around the signs. I mean, it's hundreds of miles long on both sides. It's hard to police the Grand Canyon. So it doesn't matter how many signs they put up. It, people are, are, are taking their lives into their own hands and taking a big chance. And I love this quote by Roger Clark. He said, you know, it's, no matter if it's in the Grand Canyon or right there on the streets, Everybody's pretty much one foot away between life and death. Reminds me of what David said. There's not a, but a step between me and death, right? And I think about this illustration. And I pretend it to alcohol. Everybody knows that alcohol is dangerous. But yet, we flirt with it. What makes alcohol so appealing in American society? I believe there are a few things. Number one is this. It's allowance. Alcohol is legal in America over the age of 21, just about every single state now. But you can look anywhere you want to look and you can buy alcohol because it's legal. The government says that it, that, it, that you can buy and sell it. Of course, they're going to tax it too, right? Multi-billion dollar industry. It's also appealing because of its access. No matter where you turn in the streets of Jessup, you can find alcohol just about anywhere you want to go. At some restaurants, convenience stores, liquor stores. If you want to buy alcohol in Wayne County, there are many places to find it. So alcohol is legal. It's everywhere. It's prevalent, right? So it's, it has its allowance, its access, also its acceptance. When you watch television shows, you watch movies. How many of those television shows is alcohol involved? Even when you watch something 
as animated, like The Simpsons. You have Moe's Tavern or Moe's Bar or whatever it's called. I mean, even in cartoons, people are drinking beer. In animated series, on television shows and movies, just about every show that I've, that I've grown up watching, whether it be in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, or now, alcohol is involved somewhere. Only a few shows are there, except, are, are there exceptions. But American society doesn't blink an eye at alcohol consumption. So it's appealing because of its acceptance, but also as advertisement. Over $2 billion, $2 billion a year are spent on alcohol advertising. It's big business. If the alcohol bit industry is spending over $2 billion in advertising, there's no telling how much money they're raking in. And the government gets, gets a little piece of that as well. And then lastly, it's attractiveness. When you watch a commercial, it's usually guys picturing having a great time. If there are women around, the women are beautiful, smiles, everybody's having a blast. It's always put into a positive light. And I must admit, growing up, the funniest commercials are the beer ones. There are several down through the years that I can think of where every, everybody at my school in Warner Robins, we knew what the commercials were about because they were so funny. And alcohol is appealing in American society for all of these reasons here. But none of this makes it right, as you will see based on the Word of God. So let's continue here. Why do people originally seek out alcohol? And we talked about this a few Wednesdays ago, if you want to go back and look up some of our Wednesday night sessions between Brother Van and myself. But we, we narrowed it down to four reasons why people start drinking or start abusing drugs. One is the excitement factor. A lot of people are just bored and they want something to do, especially when you're young in middle school, now in high school, even in college, you sit around, there's a lot of downtime and a lot of people turn to alcohol and they turn to drugs because life is boring to them and they want something to do because idle hands are the devil's workshop. But you also have the expected factor. A lot of people drink because they see other people doing it and they feel like they're expected to do so as well. It's what we call peer pressure. And no matter how old you are, all of us experience peer pressure. Well, there's another reason, the experiment factor. Some people are, are simply just curious. What does alcohol taste like? You can hear about people getting a buzz or getting drunk and they seem to be having a great time. What is that like? And that's appealing to a lot of folks. But the number one factor, I think, is this one, the escape factor. A lot of people turn to abuse, whether it be alcohol or drugs. Why? Because they don't feel good. They feel lousy in life. And they want to feel numb to pain, numb to sorrow. They want to deaden those negative emotions that they feel. And they want to feel better. And they use alcohol as a way to escape from the realities of life. But God has given us something far greater than alcohol. He's given us his Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul wrote this in Ephesians 5 verse 18. Do not be drunk with wine. So no Christian argues that drinking alcohol to excess beyond moderation is right. The big problem we have is dealing with social drinking, right? We're going to get into that. But Paul says, do not be drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. John B. Phillips wrote this. He kind of paraphrased it. I like the way he wrote this. He says this, don't get your stimulus from wine. It's always a danger of excess drinking. You never know who it is, as we'll see. But let the Holy Spirit stimulate your souls. The Holy Spirit is the one who can bring you excitement. He can help you to overcome those negative emotions and problems that you want to escape. The Holy Spirit living in Christ is exciting. It's enjoyable. And once you know the highs of dealing with God's Holy Spirit, you want to stay with Him. You want to, to abide, let, let Him abide in you. And those factors, those, those four factors that started with the letter A on the previous slide, the Holy Spirit can solve all those things. God's giving you something far better than alcohol, but you have to keep coming back to it, and it has negative side effects. He gives you his spirit, who never leaves you, and who will always please you, will always satisfy you. Ah, I can't spend too much time on this. i got to keep going. Let's talk about associations with alcohol. In the book of Proverbs, no matter whether you read about wine, strong drink, any type of alcohol um, wording, verbiage in this in this book really has the same associations and, and we're going to look at these three passages here this is what our Sunday school lesson is about but i'm going to bring in one that that was skipped by our lifeway folks 
and the one that at the very end when you usually on Mother's Day you hear a sermon based on Proverbs 31 well verses 4 through 7 we're going to look at these three passages here so let's talk very quickly about what are the associations with alcohol one association with alcohol is deception chapter 20 verse 1 King Solomon says wine is a mocker strong drink is raging and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise nobody picks up a beer can wine glass whatever it is nobody picks up an alcoholic drink thinking that they're going to be a drunk nobody thinks that because everybody thinks it won't impact them in a negative way it's always for somebody else it's like somebody else is going to have cancer somebody's going to have heart disease Someone that's going to experience loss in life, not me. God loves me too much. No, 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 no. When you dabble with alcohol, you are deceiving yourself. We don't know who wrote this years ago. There's a member of Alcoholics Anonymous wrote this into Ann Sanders. And if you want to read this, you can pause your screen and look through all this. I'm not going to take time to read through it all. That's what the pause button is for, where you can look this up online. But this alcoholic said this. I tried alcohol for good good things, for good reasons, for good intentions. But in the end, I got the very opposite of what alcohol promised me. And how many millions of Americans down through these last several decades have been deceived? They were ser searching for good things or, you know, with good intentions. Just to have a good time, just to relax and unwind. But in the end, they became something far worse than what they started with. So go back and read this whenever you get a chance. I gotta move on because of time time's sake. Not only is deception associated with alcohol, but also destitution. Alcohol and drugs can make you poor. Chapter 23, verse 21, it said, For the drunkard and the glutton. I know some of y'all probably read this and thought, okay, you keep what about people who love food and can't put it down? Well, heart disease and being obese and overweight, that causes a lot of deaths as well on par with alcohol, but I want, to, I want to focus on alcohol because that's where most of these verses center on. But I do want to allude to this now, gluttony, right? That's eating too much, which a lot of us do. We'll probably, I, I would say this, in America, we have more people who are gluttons than are, are drunk, drunkards. But you shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. What can alcohol cause you to lose? Much more than just a paycheck. Alcohol has called, caused people to lose spouses, to lose children, to lose career, to lose reputations. Alcohol can strip you and make you poor much more, much more than just a paycheck. And you talk to people who have lost homes and careers in houses and properties and cars and vacation homes because they couldn't put the bottle down. They will tell you they wish they had never started because it's a deception. It's a lie. And it also makes you destitute. And not just in the physical sense, it can cause you to become destitute in your soul and also in your spirit if you're a believer. Got to move on. I can't spend too much time on each of these. There's also dejection. The Bible says to give strong drink to those people who have a heavy heart. So he or she will not remember their misery anymore. In our passage today, it talks about who hath what, who hath sorrow. Give them something to drink. People who are down and out, people who are in sorrow and pain, whether it's emotional, mental, financial, spiritual. Alcohol is, is, is associated with people who are not doing well, who are suffering. Even when Jesus was on the cross, remember they tried to give him some type of gall that had alcohol in it to deaden the pain. And even Jesus said no then, right? Even Jesus said no, I don't need that. Because he had the Holy Spirit within in him, right? Because they are one. But I want you to know that alcohol brings about deception. It brings about destitution. And it's also associated with people who face dejection. People who are sorrowful. That's who alcohol is, is related to. And then we have two different things here. We have contention and confusion. And if you've ever been around drunk people, you know that both of these things are happen. You can see it in, you can see it in the movies too. But who has contentions? You find that some people cannot hold their liquor now. Some people want to drink and have a good time, and they become mean brutes. Johnny Carson was renowned for being a mean drunk, just being a vicious man. And how many people become brawlers and agitators because alcohol has taken over their body? Then have bad ones. This deals with people yapping that trap, dealing with confusion. How many people put their minds on parade, and, and they speak, and boy, they... 
they go back and wish they have never, never tasted the, the drink because of the things that they have said and the things that they have done and the fights that they have begun. All these things are associated with alcohol, guys. There's also destruction. And this more or less deals with physical destruction. It deals with your health. I'm talking about they have stricken me, but I wasn't sick. They have beaten me, but I didn't feel it. And this is very serious. Pain is something that God gives you. Pain is a gift from God. Well, that sounds crazy. Suffering from pain actually helps you. I don't have time to really get into it today. It would be a great message to deliver one, one, one day. But pain is something that, God, that your body uses to say, you know what, I need to stop and adjust what's going on. Something's not right. Well, that's true in the physical world, but also in the spiritual world. But again, I, I can't spend too much time on that. And then we talk about being bitten by a snake, by a serpent, by a viper, but that it stings. And how many people have been drunk and have, have wounded themselves and have the redness of the eyes, which is the physical after effect effects of having too much alcohol because it's intoxication. And what's the root word? Toxin, toxic, poisons. When you drink alcohol, you bring poisons into your body. And it can bring about damage that's physical. It's physical damage. You don't want to do it to your body. I love myself too much. Let's talk about destruction in terms of a nation. I got this off a government web, web site here. About facts about dealing with alcohol and deaths. Look at, look at this. The number three reason why an American will die this year is because of al alcohol. Almost a third of deaths in vehicle accidents where people have died in their vehicles deals with alcohol. Misuse of alcohol. Over a quarter of a trillion dollars spent each year in America. Not all that's spent by the government either. 80% of violent crime involves alcohol. 10% of our children have at least one parent or grandparent they're living with that has alcohol problems. And if you do that, I had to look at this twice just to make sure this, this was right. 88,000 people die a year in America because of alcohol. And you start breaking that down by 52. That's how many people die in a week. Then you just break it down... Seven days a week beyond that, you'll be astonished. Hundreds of people die a day in America because of alcohol. It is a destructive force. And we have no excuse because the book of Proverbs warns us on alcohol. We also have perversion. When you're drunk and you're intoxicated, my dear friend, you become almost like another person. Where you don't believe that there are any, there's any punitive damages coming your way. You, you can just sin with, with impunity. But the Bible says that if you're drunk, that perversion is what come, comes out. Behold, you start seeing strange women. How many people do we know messed around their spouses because they were drunk? And they went down a, a path that they never would have went down because they were drunk. Sober, they wouldn't have went off with the, somebody beyond their spouse. But they do so because they're drunk. Their heart, and notice this again, does it say the mouth? Thine heart shall utter perverse things. Anything we say comes from the human heart. And when you're drunk, the filter goes away. And you just spout out things that you feel or think. But that alcohol has taken off the, the mouth guard, or the filter, if you will. And this is what this was to the king. This is what we believe Solomon's mother told him. When you drink as a king, you're forgetting the law. You pervert judgment. How many of our government officials are drunk or drunks and who allow alcohol to help them make unwise decisions? You can go back and look that up in the news. That's every single year, every single year. And that is not, it's not just Democrats either, Republicans too. We also have stagnation. Look at verse 34 in chapter 23. You should be as a person who lies down in the middle of the sea. Top of the mass, you're laying on laying on top of the mass. What, what, you're supposed to be working. You're supposed to be seeing danger on top of that mass to, to watch where the rocks are and the things that can destroy a ship. And yet you're not doing anything. You're stagnant. You face stagnation because you're not doing the righteous things or the things you're paid to do, but you're doing, doing nothing at all. And how many of us are doing this not only in terms of our jobs and careers, but spiritually. We have a lot of spiritual stagnation, even here at Calvary. We have many people that are part of our church that aren't doing anything for the Lord. And it may not be alcohol-related, but that sure doesn't help. It's hard for God to move through a people when they have alcohol on their lips. 
It's hard to see God work freely and fully through those folks. Maybe there are some things that God wants us to do here at Calvary Baptist Church, but we're stagnant on because we won't get rid of alcohol. Just a thought, not a judge. Termination. Give drink to him who is ready to perish. And I mentioned that about Jesus already, but this, these are the associations that alcohol has in the book of Proverbs. It deals with people deceived all the way down to people who are dying. This is not a good list. I don't want to be in any of these topics here. I want them to be far away from me. I don't want to be destitute or dejected. I don't want to be perverse, and I don't want to die, and I want to speed that process up. But the Bible correlates alcohol with all these negative things in people's lives. Last but not least, addiction. Look in Proverbs chapter 23, verses 30 through 31. Alcoholism, drug abuse, do you know that it's lust? It's covetousness. Look at the language here. People are going to seek the mixed wine. Wine that's being fermented. They're looking unto the wine. That deals with lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh. Proverbs 23, verse 35. When I wake, I will seek it yet again. How many people are addicted to drug abuse or alcohol abuse? Never meant to be. They were deceived. But it happens to a great deal of people. And I'm sure not a single addict thought it was going to happen to them. The Bible is warning us about alcohol. And I know what you're going to say. I, I still don't want being drunk. We'll get into that. I'll say, I don't know who said this, but it was, somebody said this years ago. It's not the last drink what causes a man to become an addict. It is the first one. That's why it's so important not to drink alcohol at all. And if, if you have been drinking alcohol, stop. You don't want to become that person. You never know. It could be you. You never know. It's an old Japanese proverb from hundreds of years ago. About the man takes the drink and then the drink takes the drink. Then the drink takes the man. You know, it's so deceptive because it's so dangerous. Because it looks so appealing, you know? It looks like it's a lot of fun. But it's, but it's bitterness, though. It lasts a lot longer than its sweet taste going in. Just got to be very careful, guys. I know what you're thinking, but... But, all right, here we go. What about me? I'm a social, social drink, drinker. I'm not getting drunk. Okay. I hear that a lot. There's nothing wrong with me having a beer at my house. If I want to eat a steak and watch a ball game and have, have a beer, go to a restaurant, enjoy some wine. I'm not getting drunk, Pete. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay. All right. Then we have somebody else says, I'm not the only one doing it. Now, that sounds like what little kids say, <laughs> right? I didn't do it alone, Mom. Somebody else. I didn't make the only 45 in trigonometry, Mom. The whole class did. Mother didn't want to hear about all that, everybody else. Poor, poor excuse there. Another excuse people have. I'm only hurting... Myself, if anybody, I'm not hurting anybody else when I drink. I'm not cranking up a car. I'm not driving drunk. I'm not hitting anybody. I'm not slapping my spouse around when I get home or the kids. I can hold my alcohol. I'm okay. I'm good. I hope you can hear this. The moderate drinker is more dangerous than the drunk when it comes to other people. Let, hear me out. If I'm a teenager driving down the road... And I see drunks who are living on the street, nappy-headed, nasty beards. I mean, I mean, they look like hot mess. I'm not going to drink by looking at them. But you know what will make me more, will push me over the edge if, if I'm teetering whether I should try it or not? Is when I look at somebody and they can drink and they can hold it and they're okay. Because guess who I'm going to associate myself with? Well, if I drink, I'm not going to be like that bum red over there, over there on the bench every single night, and vomit everywhere. He's got no no friends. I'll be like Mister So and So. He looks so cool and swell. Look at him. He's enjoying himself, sophisticated, he's having a great time. I'll be more like him. The moderate drinker hurts others more than the drunk does, because nobody wants to be be the drunk. They want to be the guy who can handle it. And everybody thinks that's them. Another excuse. I'm not breaking the law. It's my right. Christian, you have no rights. You only have responsibilities. We've discussed that before in the past. You don't have any rights. You have responsibilities. I'm going to come back to this one. It's because you make and drink a beer or two. 
out at a restaurant and not be drunk or having a buzz doesn't necessarily make it right. The government allows a lot of things that are wrong in God's book. So that should not be your number one excuse. Well, the government says I can. The government is not our standard. It relaxes me after a long day. Oh, I heard that a lot. I just need a little something, something when I get home after a long, stressful day. Pete, look at you. Woo! You're good looking. You're attractive. You're charismatic. You've got a great personality. Your parents are alive. You've got a beautiful wife and a beautiful daughter. What do you know about stress? What do you know about tension in life? You don't know what I go through. When I come home, I need a little something, something to get, get me by to steal my nerves. It's like Miss Rhonda Dempsey asked, well, what's the Holy Spirit for? Remember what Paul wrote in Ephesians 5. You don't need alcohol. You need the Spirit. The Spirit can help you relax. <laughs> you don't need alcohol. That's what the Holy Spirit's for. And I love this one. Jesus drank wine. At the Passover, remember he had the, the vine, the fruit of the vine. It was never called wine. Keep that in mind. It's called the cup or the fruit of the, fruit, fruit of the vine. Even people back in the Old Testament days, remember in John chapter 2, where Jesus turned the water into wine, he was at the wedding. Now, I don't have time to break, it, break down all the Hebrew and Greek words for wine, but if you study it carefully, the Bible always condemns wine when it deals with fermented wine. And some of our words for wine and strong drink, uh, you know, just, just heard this past week, you know, in the original Hebrew, there is no strong drink, it's just drink. Strong was added by, by the translators to make it read a little bit better or more smoothly. But when you read wine in the Bible, it's not necessarily wine that you buy at a store that's already been fermented. A lot of times it's like grape juice. It could be like a syrup on, almost, a jam. People want to read into it what they want to. But if you study it carefully, I... I do not believe Jesus drank any type of alcohol that, that was intoxicated. Yeah, I, I just don't believe that. Because those words use either intoxicating or not. And I just can't see the, the Holy Son of God putting alcohol that may intoxicate himself into his mouth. If he didn't do it at the cross, why would he do it during the good times? Mm. Show me the verse. <laughs> Does it say thou shalt not drink? Show me the verse. I think these are excuses that a lot of us hear. I don't know, some of you may not agree, or somebody shared with you this video. You don't agree with me, I got it. But to me, these are flimsy excuses here. At the Georgia Baptist Mission Board last year in 2019, a pastor who moved up to Tennessee, Jordan Easley, talked about alcohol. He did a great job too, and I'm sure you go on the website and you can find his whole message. And I wrote down these questions. And this, he said, these are questions that people, should, a Christian should ask him or herself before they take a drink. Number one is, what does the law say? So you know right now, if you're below 21 years of age, you should not be drinking alcohol, not a single sip. What does wisdom say? Well, go back to the book of Proverbs. What, what is wisdom attached to? Is it wise to drink? What does your conscience say? A lot of people struggle with this alcohol issue. If you read Romans 14, if you can't do it in good faith, you shouldn't do it. If you're not sure if you should listen to secular music, don't do it. If you're not sure if you should drink alcohol, don't do it. If you're not sure, sure that you should, you should go watch certain movies, don't do it. The Bible is clear in terms of its principles. Does it make me more like Jesus? I'll go back to this, what I said before. I don't think Jesus drank fermented wine. I don't believe that. I believe he drank water and a lot of grape juice. And it was good, too. Here we go. Does it help or hinder my witness for Jesus? You can be a stumbling block or a stepping stone based on your testimony. Now, before I was ordained, I did not, and I'm patting myself on the back, is I believe every Christian should, should come to this thought. Going back to Romans 14, especially in verse 21. I did not drink alcohol because of my standing in the community as a school teacher and as a coach and as a, a member of church, an active member of church. I said, if, I'm, if a kid sees me at a restaurant or coming out of a store with alcohol in either my shopping cart or on my table, they, they're going to think this, Mr. Boyd's a good guy. If he can drink, it must be okay for me to drink. 
And I go back to that point that I made about moderating or moderator drinkers. That's dangerous for people. I did not want to be used as an excuse for somebody to get drunk. I had one student say, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Where did you get that from? And I said, I got it from the Bible. <laughs> I, I told the class this. I said, I don't drink alcohol because I love you. That should be on all of our minds as Christians. Just because you have the right or the freedom to do things doesn't mean that you shouldn't love. In love, we should abstain from certain things. Alcohol being one of them. My prayer for you and for me now, not only, not, only, not only for you, but for me, my wife, and my child, let's focus on five words that start with the letter A, abstinence. I believe the best way not to become a drunk and not to be susceptible to it or to ruin your witness is to abstain. So if you're, if you're a drinker, my advice to you as a Christian is to stop. I believe in association. You read in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 20. Solomon said, don't join yourself with wine bibbers. Well, if you don't join and hang out with drunks, what does that mean? You hang out with people who don't drink. I believe that your association should be with people who are like-minded. And y'all should abstain together. Anointing. Instead of being filled with a desire to have chemicals and poisons in your body to make you feel good, why don't we try being anointed with God's Spirit? I, I've never met a man or a woman who was totally anointed with God's Spirit. I mean, full of the Spirit who drank. I, I've, I've just never seen that. And you haven't either. I'm pretty sure of that. Adoration. Out of love, we should choose not to drink. And out of love, we should not put it in somebody's face, too. That we should also acknowledge, have acknowledgement in our lives. That the only reason why I can abstain is because the Holy Spirit has anointed me. And he gives me the ability to abstain. He's the one who leads me to associate with godly people. He's the one who leads me to love other folks based on the decisions that I make. But we should acknowledge in humility that it's not us doing it, it's God's Spirit doing it through us. And that we can share that joy with somebody else. We should not be high-minded. I'm going to close with this slide. My favorite preacher of all time, Woo! Adrian Pierce Rogers. He said this years ago. Some people are going to hell because they drink. What does that mean? They can't give up alcohol. They're a slave to it. They don't want to come to Christ because they're enslaved by alcohol. He says some people are going to hell because they drink. But look at this one. But some are going to hell because they do not drink. What does that mean? That means because they feel like they're okay, that they don't have an alcohol problem, that there's really no need to get saved. There's no need to bow the knee to Jesus Christ. That's a powerful statement there. Because a lot of us, if we're teetotalers, we've never had a drink in our lives. We'll look at somebody and say, oh, you boy, you sinner, you drinkers need to come to Christ. But have we ever come to Christ? Or it's because we're holy and pure on that one issue that we think we don't need to bend the knee to Jesus. But you do, whether you drink or don't drink. Because there are going to be drunkards in heaven, and there are going to be a lot of drunkards in hell. There are going to be people who've never drunk in hell and people who've never drunk in heaven. The key is this, do you know Jesus? So that's the first and foremost thing. And I'm going to pray that, not, number one, you know Jesus, but also that the Holy, you let the Holy Spirit rule and reign in your life. Whew, that's a tough topic. And I could talk about this for another 20 minutes, but you're not going to watch it. <laughs> but anyway, if you have any questions or comments, just give, give us a call at the church here at Calvary Baptist, Jess of Georgia. You can text or call me, 478-997-9063. If you know somebody who's struggling with alcohol or if they're very young and you want them to be warned, I want to share this video with, with them. I think it would be a great idea. But anyway, we love you. Hope you have a great week. I'm going to pray this out. Dear Lord, I pray for each person who is watching and listening. No more, I pray that they know Jesus. Whether they've ever tasted alcohol or not, I pray, Father God, that they, they know Jesus. And Lord, if they do know Jesus as a Lord and personal Savior, I pray that they will be anointed with your Holy Spirit to where they will abstain from alcohol, where they will associate with believers, Father God, where they will adore and love people, and they will acknowledge and not be pious and be arrogant, but be loving towards people and to help others. I pray, Father God, that this topic, that, you, that if somebody's not burdened, that you will place a burden in their hearts and their lives to stop. Give them the power, Father God, to seek means to stop. And I pray for those families who are going through tough ordeal with alcohol. 
families we don't even know about that they're suffering from from this dreaded dreaded enslavement they don't share it with anybody but lord i pray that you give them peace and give them hope father god that they'll reach out and contact somebody to at least pray with them and to help them during this crisis but i pray for our homes and our families at calvary I pray for god you give us the victory over alcohol i pray this in jesus name amen we love you at calvary see you soon Revival's coming up in a few weeks. Be praying for that.